Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Sapursky. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Carl May, the CEO of Join Digital. Carl, can you tell us a little bit about what Join Digital does? Yes, thank you for the invitation. And uh, let me give you a little overview, Join. Join is um, a technology company. We're based in Silicon Valley. We focus on providing a full stack technology solution for really the Fortune 2500 companies, typically focused on their remote or for their hybrid work environments, um, where they want to provide everything from uh, the technology, so advanced secure technology services, connectivity, cloud connectivity, but leading all the way up to workplace analytics so that uh, the, the people who are actually paying the bills, the companies can understand and tune how the work environments that they're creating for their employees. And so that's sort of a synopsis of what we do. Excellent. Now, when you're looking at employees who are working in a hybrid modality, what are the most important concerns of the employers, your customers, that they are thinking about in regards to these employees who are working in a hybrid modality? What are the most important focus points? So first of all, I love the fact you use the word modality. So at least that makes two of us that 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 have been trying to make others think about think about it in that in, in using that terminology. Um, <clears throat> number two would be that if I if I look at it, the way most of our more we'll call them enlightened custom uh, customers, we we really sell typically into six um, six sectors right now: high tech, life science, biotech energy, media, financial services, um, banking, and then professional services. That's that's really where we focus our time. So we do have it's a skew more to knowledge workers um, in terms of the audience that we we focus on. What most of our um what what, what if, if I if I had to go out and survey most of our customers, most of what they're going to be talking about is how do they create an environment, number one, that um, that appeals to the needs of their workers. And so they're really working on how do they make sure that that they can provide them with an effective workspace uh, mm -hmm. when they do come into the in, into work, uh, or frankly, and I, I'm happy to talk about a couple of interesting transitions that some of our, some of our customers have gone through, maybe without naming them, but I can talk sure. about them as a financial sort a big bank or something. But the idea is that uh, number one, how do you how do you drive uh, greater satisfaction? Number two, how do you drive greater productivity? Productivity, by the way, might uh, then involve that. Really, comes down to allowing a variety of modalities of work, such as working from home mm. or working from not in the office. We'll call it that. Um, but in in terms of what they focus on primarily is is um, is the employee satisfaction and productivity? Mm -hmm. um, what what they what they don't always think about until we sort of bring it up is more like the dissatisfaction mm -hmm. items. You and I are doing. I'm s sitting in our office. By the way, this is a join delivered. Uh, we're in our we're in a temporary office in between two permanent offices. But this is a this is that where our experience. I hope will be very positive. Uh, because the technology that that you're using and we're using is superior, but but I was on a call early this morning where a very important part of the team was on a Zoom or Teams actually Microsoft Teams, and it, it was completely worthless. So mm -hmm. you know, dissatisfaction is is poor technology, poor mm -hmm. environments, noisy environments, can't concentrate, can't I, I or I, or I can't get work done or or. Or whatnot, and so how how do employers, how do companies, really adjust the work environment to accommodate the needs of their, or, or certainly to to remove the dissatisfaction points that their employees have. And so that leads to a question of what kind of work is best done where? Where is the work best? What kind of work is best done in the office, and what kind of work is best done at home? I was just talking to a client that was figuring this issue out 
And what they didn't know and the, what they figured out after I did some focus groups for them is that the office was a quite noisy environment and distracting environment. And it was really hard for people to get their work done. So a lot of the leaders, the C-suite of my client, they're not happy that many of their senior employees who they expect to mentor younger employees, that they're coming yeah. into the office, <clears throat> they're putting on their headphones or they're going into their office, personal office, closing their door, and they're not interacting with their younger employees. And that is a serious problem for them. But the office is a noisy place. And let's say a video conference meeting. There are video conference meetings happening all the time that workers are taking from their cubicles, which is not great because they're distracting everyone else. They distract the neighbors, right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And that is a serious issue. So what kind of work have you found to be most effectively done in the office versus what kind of work is most effectively done in a remote setting? That's, uh, I mean, I, I can provide a lot of answers there, but let me, I'll, I'll try to provide sort of broad brushed answer and then some mm -hmm. specifics. Starting with broad brushed, obviously um, work that requires greater collaboration, whiteboarding, mm -hmm. or if you're, if you're doing software development and you need to have a, a weekly scrum meeting or something, an agile scrum meeting, those are going to be much more effective if performed face-to-face, -face, uh, problem solving where people are dealing with problems or they're, or they're, um, they're brainstorming new ideas. Those are absolutely anything collaboration based is, mm -hmm. is in general much better and much more, the outcomes are better. The ability to see body language, uh, to, to take physical cues from somebody like, uh, you know, uh, what, mm -hmm. what, that wasn't such a great idea. You, you, you know, if if I turn my camera off, you're not really going to know what I what I'm saying or thinking um, here from you know from remote, and so I think that in in the office, uh, collaborative work is is very important. Um, and then if you go to the other end of the spectrum, if you look at and I I don't know that everybody is so disciplined about it, but I know I know several people some of several people I've met, they've gotten to the point where they do their email only before, you know, eight o'clock in the morning when they're at home and then they'll do an, an hour again or something in the middle of the day mm -hmm. and then at the end of the day. And so reading documents, uh, uh, preparing for an interview with Dr. Gleb, also mm -hmm. very important that I do that when I can concentrate and ideally not when my gardener is, uh, you know, blowing leaves and my dogs are barking, mm -hmm. although that was at home. But But I think that the that the, uh, the concentration work, in particular for knowledge workers, um, is is ideal uh, when it's in a quiet space. And so you mm -hmm. raised an issue that I think is is pretty interesting, which is I come from I grew up in Silicon Valley, if you if you will, um, and of course we we pioneered the hideous cube factories. And then those morphed into these boiler room environments that Mike Bloomberg actually, I think, was really the pioneer of. Hmm. And those are horribly distracting yeah. uh, environments, right? I, as a matter of fact, we, we had lots of meeting rooms so that people go sit in a in a meeting room. And you know, one of the one of the trends that we're seeing is that a number of our customers are now creating, whether it's a huddle more huddle rooms or mm -hmm. private offices. They're actually creating. They're moving away from the cube farms and the and the boiler room <laughs> environments to um, to environments where people can sit in in a, in a quiet place and do some work, as opposed to as you pointed out early on, coming going to the office and being distracted by the person. I don't have my prop of a headphone there, mm -hmm. but uh, somebody sitting next door to me making noise, you know, speaking loudly on a conference call or something. And so there's definitely a trend to more private, um, more quiet offices away from big open spaces, so open spaces, more for informal conversation, and then a lot of collaboration space. Those are probably three, three of the trends that we're witnessing right now. And so when you think about the kind of collaboration, so I, I very much agree <clears> with you. The office is really for collaboration. So when I talk to clients, I say, the office is for collaboration, for socializing, for in-depth training, and sometimes for yes. performance conversations, evaluation conversations. 
So conversations with your manager. Those are really the four issue, four things you want to do in the office. But when you think about the percent, the proportion of time that employees spend on this, it's less than 10% of your time. It's very high stakes value activity, mm -hmm. but it's a very small proportion of your time. So why do you figure there are many companies that are asking employees to come to the office for three, four days a week? <clears throat> well, we've what, one of the topics that uh, so, so first of all, I think you've got you've got some generational changes that are going to need to to flush mm. through the system. Uh, mm. People of my my um, old generation, we all we've ever known, frankly, is going to the office. And for us, mm -hmm. um, in particular, if you've been in technology, the the um, opportunity to interact with colleagues <clears throat> and just just brainstorm ad hoc has actually been sort of part and parcel of of uh of how we do our work um mm -hmm. you know i started my career at hewlett packard company mm -hmm. uh, hewlett packard started management by walking around that was the mm -hmm. whole notion that a manager walked yeah. around and socialized with people understood what they were doing i think there's some generational generational issues i think that mm -hmm. you're but i do think there's good evidence in several of the industries that we sell in. I mean, you're just not going to be doing inventing a new drug uh, from your living room. You're not sure. going to be, and, and candidly, um, complex technology products are probably also not going to be do, done predominantly with a, while there are exceptions, uh, there are certainly exceptions, I think Atlassian is a well-known exception. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is that there are, there are still, I, I think when we try to say, well, everything is all software products are like that. Well, they they aren't. I mean, there's there's a lot of different, um, <clears throat> you know, there are a lot of different types of products, and so I think that there is still a view that that collaboration, um, you know, collaboration is is critical. I will also mm -hmm. say that for mentoring of the next generation, we're mm -hmm. we're going to we, I've been talking to several of our very large clients that like one of them is specifically talking about have we lost three years of new hires where mm. they will never be able to catch up mm. and integrate properly at our company do we actually have to start managing them figuring out how to manage their careers or move them to some other company encourage them to leave because we've lost three years let's say due to the pandemic we've lost three years of mentorship and so the graduates from May of 2020 or June, June of 2020 and 2021 and even a little bit of 2022 have not had the same pairing with more experienced uh, colleagues. And so I think that mm -hmm. when we think about, I, 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 I will also say, so having grown up predominantly in Europe, uh, Western Europe, at least. Uh, where work is still very social and mm -hmm. homes are very, very small um, in Germany. And so consequently you have, you know, I do think that there is a, there is a social element to work that, which you brought up, uh, that it's it's hard to quantify it as, I, I agree, I, I don't like to be bothered by somebody walking in and just wanting to chat with me uh, about, you know, some television program which I guarantee you I've never seen. Hmm. Um, but but nonetheless, there are there are interactions on a number of levels that I think are 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 pretty critical. And so hmm. having having spoken a lot to to technology HR leaders, there's there's a lot of concern about, you know, how, how are we going to get subsequent generations trained up to the same level that the you know, our, our 10 to 15 year, 10 to 20 year uh, tenured employees have. Yeah, it's definitely a big concern. I mean, <clears throat> from early on the pandemic, I was helping clients with this. And the tool here is, of course, having a good mentoring program. Specifically, during that stage of the pandemic, it had to be remote only. And that involved having a mentor from your own team and also having a mentor from your outside of your team. Because the biggest thing that's lost is those weak ties to people from outside your team, for junior people who have never built those ties. That's really important right, to have yes. a mentor. 
it's really important to have a mentor from outside your team to build those ties, integrate into team culture, as well as having a mentor from your own team, that kind of buddy who would help you with your work. So I'm really sad to hear about that large tech company that, or I don't know, I don't remember if it's a tech, but anyway, company. It was, that yeah. Yes, but but it's not just one. I, I gave you an, amalg an, an amalgamation. Right. Have several, several companies in a few of the categories that we're in were, were, were just not being, um, uh, you know, they're finding that 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 next generation of of talent is it's going to be difficult. We're, we like, like I say, have they? How much have they lost over the last three years? Yeah, I definitely I've seen this be a problem, and I've look look discussions in the news, discussions with potential clients, and when I ask them what kind of mentoring do they do remote mentoring. They say, well, we don't really do that. We only used to do in-person mentoring and then we didn't actually do anything that remote. And I'm like, okay, well, here you go. It's not about an in-person issue. It's a mentoring issue. And uh, I definitely recommend for my clients to do some in-person mentoring now that yeah. they can, because mentoring in person is more effective in terms of building trust and cultivating those connections. But during the time of the pandemic, you definitely should have been doing some remote mentoring. <laughs> Well, I think the pandemic, I mean, look, it's, it's, um, I, I think that the variety of reactions to the pandemic is, is, um, it's pretty broad, the, the <laughs> spectrum of reactions. And consequently, you know, it's clear that not a lot of companies had done the proper disaster recovery yeah. or, or planning of, well, what, what if scenario? responses and as a matter of fact early on in the pandemic we had we had a, a large very large customer base that that had by nature of their very by very by, by the very nature of their business had never ever contemplated a situation in which their employees would ever work remotely ever mm. and and so you go from a situation where you know I mean, Superstorm Sandy in New York for financial services, that was a few days or or a week or two of at most of of disruption. Of course, those people who lost their houses might view it differently. But you had a lot of folks that had never never contemplated that they would be working remotely and did not have the tools. Uh, and I think that really became, you know, th that th there was a lot of catch up that had to happen. And and along the way, hmm. a lot of companies made decisions that they probably later regretted. And hmm. and one of them was when you're just trying to figure out how to keep the wheels on the car, thinking about mentorship is is something like is, is something that the is that priority that might get left behind early on. Hmm. And now, of course, it has become as we've seen uh, waves of reactions of employees resignate. You know the huge wave of resignations, <clears throat> people quitting. Now we we may see another reset through um, economic dislocation. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's creating it a whole other set of challenges. And so I, I do think that the I, I think that it's it was it was certainly a I mean I mean join as a small company, but when we go out and talk to the spectrum of customers from you know probably our smallest customers 1000 or 1500 employees and the largest one is probably 150 or 200,000 employees that's that uh, across that spectrum every one of them uh i think almost without exception is still trying to figure out how do they get people um how, how do they deal with disaffection uh, how do they deal with employee satisfaction? One one of our customers during the pandemic, a very large financial services company, they just said, you know what, we're gonna, we're actually, they, they'd been using data we'd been collecting from them and finally realized that if you look at any one day, they never had more than 20 or 25% of their employees showing up, coming into Manhattan. Yeah. And they just said, they blew up the Manhattan office mm -hmm. and built six satellite locations so nice. that the average the average commute time of an employee went from a little over an hour 
to right around 20 minutes. So that's a, nice. that's, a that's a 67%, almost a 67% yep. decrease. And so if you can give people back hours of their day, um, that 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 incentive, you still might not have everybody, you know, maybe different groups, uh, but the the you know, there is a there are a couple of effects there, one of which is you're giving people back. Mm -hmm. Um, you're giving people back their time. You're giving people back. Uh, you're, you're you're taking away frustrations, which is like driving in traffic yeah. on the Jersey Turnpike, maybe, mm -hmm. but or or delays on on the train. Um, and the bet is that they're going to get they're going to get better productivity, better employee satisfaction um, out of that trade off. And they just weren't they just weren't recognizing or didn't want to recognize the data which is the data set that had been telling them all along that that their employees weren't coming to the office. It just, they just ignored it. Hmm. And finally they acted on it. So I, I, I wonder what, I do think that that will be, that will be another um, trend that we'll see uh, as companies, especially in large in big metropolitan areas with huge traffic problems. They're going to have to look at, at solving that problem as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I always tell my clients that the biggest thing you want to be thinking about to improve your employee satisfaction and morale is decreasing commuting time. However, you want to do that, decreasing the amount of time they spend in the office, packing more things into the time they spend in the office, using that more efficiently. Excellent. Well, this is a great point to wrap up. Thank you very much. That was very helpful, Carl. Thank you. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you check this out and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.